Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five tour. I am your host, curator Kevin Adkison, and I am over here at the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House uh, because the internet connection is great and it's out at my house. Um, that's a, that is true, but I am actually here because we are preparing to deliver a 7 p.m. lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. It is the third in our series of Uncovering Cranbrook Lectures, and so tonight at 7 o'clock I will be talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and his passion for Asian architecture, his collection of Asian art, his dealing in Japanese prints, and the way that all of his interactions with the Far East influenced his designs here uh, at the Smith House, but also throughout his career. Thank you. Uh, I also like this jacket. It is finally cool enough to wear a wool coat. Um, it is the first day of fall here, and I can't feel my fingers or toes because there is heat nowhere, and it is icy in all of my residences. So. I thought to compliment tonight's lecture, which I hope that all of you uh, are considering joining. If you don't already have your ticket, you can buy them for $20 on center.cranbrook.edu. So in, to compliment the lecture and not just repeat what I'm going to tell you at 7, I thought we would do a close look at some of the Japanese objects here at the Smith House. Now. In the course of the lecture, I'll be talking about the design of the Smith House and how it is really indebted to Japanese domestic design. Um, but we'll look at some specific cases that aren't in my lecture, including the gate here, which um, is attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright, though I believe that it may simply be a Taliesin associated architect's design. Uh, it may be from after Frank Lloyd Wright's time living. Um, he died in 1959 and this gate was first installed in 1968. I need to get to Columbia University and study the blueprints of the house and figure out if the gate was designed by Wright or if it was designed by his associates. Well, what's interesting about the gate is that it has this very strong figural line work that is very much indebted to sort of Japanese prints. The next great Japanese influence in the house is Frank Lloyd Wright's signature. The little signature block down here was something that Frank Lloyd Wright first started using in the 1890s, and then he simplified it and simplified it until uh, the 1930s, he was simply using a red square with an FLLW for Frank Lloyd Wright. And it was inspired by Japanese woodblock prints, where the print master would stamp his work with a red square that had his uh, name within it or her name within it. Frank Lloyd Wright adopted it, and so he would sort of stamp his. Uh, works of architecture as works of art, and he only gave these to clients who he thought had done a great job with his projects. Mr. Smith was so nervous when he received his, he dropped it, and you can see a crack running down through it. Then we're squeezed into our compression into the home, and then we are released with the view out to the garden. And the garden itself at Smith House actually is quite indebted to Japan and Japanese gardens. Um, I won't be talking as much about that tonight, uh, but this idea of a sort of natural landscape that's manicured and then has uh, shrubs of all different shades of green within the Tufa volcanic rock, it's all very Japanese. Let's see. So one of my favorite things in the house and one of the oldest things in the house that is indebted to Jap uh, Japanese culture is the collection of Ikebana. Now we have some Ikebana that's made of permanent botanicals, which are simply fake plants. But this piece is actually made of dried plant matter. And it 
possibly was made by Mrs. Smith. It has been around since the mid-1950s. We don't really dust it because I live in fear that it is going to either A, be eaten, or B, fall apart. But it's this uh, very much inspired by Japanese, the art of Japanese flower arranging. Then below that, we see some books on Japanese history. But the Smiths also had a reprinting of Frank Lloyd Wright's hit 1912 book, The Japanese Print, an Interpretation by Frank Lloyd Wright. As you'll learn tonight at the lecture, Frank Lloyd Wright was America's foremost dealer in Japanese prints uh, around 1912 to 1920. And he wrote this book in 1912. And it really is, it's interesting what he highlights of the Japanese print. And it's very much uh, graphic quality and a quality of sort of establishing mood and and the way that the artist use line, color, shape, and sort of depth to create this modern aesthetic. And Frank Lloyd Wright traces all of modern art back to the Japanese woodblock print. What he doesn't so much do is sort of take it from a historical standpoint. He did not speak Japanese, and he wasn't really concerned with what was going on in the prints um, so much as how they looked. So the Smiths had a copy, uh, a 1960s printing of the Japanese print interpretation. Now, this is a piece that caused great laughter to uh, uh, among my friends at the Mid-Michigan Japan America Society uh, when they visited um, uh, to lead tea ceremonies here at the house. They came in and they all just sort of cackled at what's happening here. And I didn't quite know why they were laughing. It looks like, to me, some sort of, you know, kettle hanging in the fireplace. In fact, this is an implement for a Japanese tea ceremony. And the reason they laughed is that these little feet down here are meant for this sort of heater to sit on a tatami mat. And so you put your hot coals in here, and then your water is here. And so this is how you boil the water for the tea ceremony, but it's a fully sort of independent unit. So it would be a little bit like hanging um, your toaster oven above a fireplace and saying that you were going to make toast. It just it doesn't make any sense that you would hang a piece of equipment over an open fire. But Mr. Smith, you know, his love of Japan, it was self-taught. Um, and so I, I don't know whether he knew that this was incorrect or if he thought that this was aesthetically pleasing. Either way, I think it's a great story. And the Japanese ladies were very entertained at this sort of mismatch of uh, tea culture and a fireplace. If you'd like to get a behind the scenes look of where I'll be speaking tonight, here is my setup for the evening. Again, the lecture starts at seven o'clock. And tickets are still on sale for uh, my celebration of Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. Moving on into the dining room, we have um, a Japanese candlesticks here. Um, now, this looks to me like something that's within the realm of the Smiths were purchasing this at an American retail outlet. They never traveled to Japan, um, but these are Japanese candle holders. And I took one candle off so you could see it better. And it's next to a Danish candle holder that was retailed at sort of all great design stores in the mid-century. And the glass is Swedish. So it's, it is sort of just, you know, globalization here. What is more specific to Japan, though, would be things like these tall vertical teacups with painted blue and white decoration. We see chrysanthemums there in the centers. I don't know, dandelions here at the front. And these teacups, which there's a set of four, but one came to us broken. Um, these were gifts, most likely from Japanese visitors. So I don't know exactly how it started, but the Smiths had Japanese exchange students, they had Japanese architects and Japanese um, friends, 
and they would visit the house, stay in the house, and they would bring gifts. And they would also send Christmas cards and all sorts of postcards, which are now at Cranbrook Archives. But here in the house, we're left with this legacy of gifts. Now, the Smiths put their Japanese teacups on this little Japanese fan with gold leaf. I did have my uh, friend and board member, Masami Hida, come over and help me think about some of these objects. And she said that a little tray like this with the gold leaf and the lacquer would never be used for tea ceremonies. It would never be used for serving or for any type of sort of sweets. This is very much something that you would use to put dolls out or you would lean against a sort of altar for a celebration. So again, the Smiths, you know, collecting their Japanese artifacts and then using them in interesting ways. Now, in the cabinet here, um, and I don't have my gloves, so we'll look at it from afar, we see a little tea box. And somehow, I thought I could turn the flashlight on, but maybe I can't on Instagram. Um, this little tea box is from Japan. It was another gift from a visitor, and it's made out of the bark of cherry blossom trees. And so it is actually a tin box. Um, but then the bark is wrapped around the metal container. A little behind the scenes look into the kitchen. Now, of course, folding screens are uh, uh, popular throughout China, Japan, Korea. And the Smiths have their own very beautiful mid-century modern interpretation of an Asian style screen. When Mr. Smith commissioned this screen, he was thinking of Frank Lloyd Wright's um, own screen designs with Frank Lloyd Wright graphics. Um, but of course, Frank Lloyd Wright used screens in the home because of his own collection of 18th century screens. And so there, it is sort of one step removed from the um, idea that Wright was using, which was the only good art for the home was a Japanese print or a Japanese or Asian screen. And so the, our screen is sort of descendant from that idea. Here in the kitchen, um, we see a sake set, uh, actually two sake sets. So on the right, we have the server, the uh, tokuri. And then here we have the cups for one set and then the matching sets, the choco. And these pieces are from the Maritani company, which I looked it up and it's just a sort of gift shop company. So it does seem like most of the Japanese objects the Smiths had are for the tourist trade. There are a couple of things here in the hallway from Japan. They are stamped made in Japan, which means that they are 20th century and that they were made for the export market. So in the form of an ancient Japanese or Chinese bronze, we have this three-legged uh, cast bronze piece from Japan. Then we also have this really beautiful tea pitcher, which if I'm remembering what Masami told me, she sort of looked at it and just said, mm, it's lovely, but that is very much a, a tourist market piece. A Japanese tea pitcher would not be quite that extreme of the sort of tiny size and very squat nature. And then down below it uh, is Mikasa, the, the Japanese plate company, a reissue of the Imperial Hotel service from Frank Lloyd Wright's 1923 uh, Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, which was the main hotel for Westerners who were staying at the staying in Tokyo. And so Frank Lloyd Wright designed two patterns, a formal one for the main dining room, and then this is the informal, sometimes called the balloon pattern, uh, that was done for the bar area. Uh, the originals are in Japan. These are a 1979 reissue by Mikasa. Now, there is this little interesting Japanese box in here, which is made of cloisonne, uh, which is glass inset within metal. And so this is a piece by a Japanese artist. It's unmarked, but we have the artist's name from records over in the archive. So this is a, a one-off piece. It is a lidded vase, which is not a form that makes a ton of sense to me, um, but it is a beautiful piece from the 1970s. And then Sarah Smith's thank you for not smoking sign. <laughs> 
So if you're just joining me, uh, we are doing a little bit of a preview for tonight's lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan, which I'll be delivering at 7 o'clock. Tickets are still on sale for $20 um, at center.cranbrook.edu. And tonight's lecture is going to focus on Frank Lloyd Wright's travels to Japan, his collection of Asian art, and his uh, career building in Japan, and then building Japanese-style homes. So today's Live at Five tour is simply a compliment to the lecture because we'll spend not as much time on the Smith House tonight. In Sarah's fabulous little study with its amazing sort of crown of skylight and electric light, which I am cleaning that tomorrow, um, in the study we see a little Buddha. And the Smiths were uh, both born Jewish, Sarah converted to Christian science, and Melvin practiced transcendentalism. Uh, but Frank Lloyd Wright had tons of Buddhas in his own house, uh, and the Smiths certainly were aware of Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin home, and they had visited it, and they saw his Buddhas, and so I'm not sure how they got their piece, uh, but it, it would have certainly, I think, appealed to the Smiths to, to decorate in a manner similar to their great hero, Frank Lloyd Wright. Also in this room is one of my favorite pieces, um, uh, which is this little mini uh, Japanese print screens. And so you open them up and then they unfold. I'm seeing, if, if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is. I have had this happen before with people. And so if you can't hear me now, uh, maybe try rewatching it. But if you can't hear me now, you can't hear that instruction. So. We'll just keep on our little Japanese tour of the Smith House by Frank Lloyd Wright from 1950. So in the restroom, this window sort of gets squeezed into the corner. And what I love about it is when you stand to wash your hands, you're left with this very sort of um, beautifully framed view that looks very much like a Japanese pillar print, which was Frank Lloyd Wright's favorite print uh, type to collect. And it is this very tall vertical window that then has the oak trees beyond and the little sculpture in the yard sort of catching our attention. So I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it, I certainly see it after looking at photographs of Frank Lloyd Wright's print collection for days on end. I stood in the bathroom and I said, aha, a pillar print window. Now, this little object here, I would never have guessed was Japanese. Uh, but in fact, this is a Gyosha, which is a Japanese ox cart from the Edo period, so the 1600s to the, to the 1868. And they were a two-wheeled form of transport. And the Japanese nobility and wealthy people preferred to travel by ox, not horse, because the slower movement was smoother. And there was this idea that if you were wealthy and noble, there was no need to uh, sort of move any quicker than an ox. And the ox was more reliable and more sort of strong and majestic. So this is a um, guyusha, which sometimes would be open like this to, for you to sit in or to carry. But then other times they were built with little um, tile roofs or fabric roofs as well. Also in this room are two lacquer boxes that may be plastic. I need to get some second opinions, but I'm not sure that it's actually lacquer wood. Uh, again, likely gifts from Japanese visitors. In this box, uh, Mrs. Smith stored her earrings, her clip-on earrings, which we have now moved uh, into their own storage but she liked to keep her little clip-ons there, which makes me think of my own grandmother and her vast collection of clip-on earrings. So there's just a couple of other objects that I want to highlight on our little walking tour. And one I forgot in the living room. So we'll head back over to my incense burner. And the incense burner is a really fabulous piece. It's 
terribly heavy, both visually and uh, physically. And what's interesting, so you have the spots for the incense burning, and it has this wonderful shape to it, this saucer form. Uh, and then on the top of it is the form of a Japanese coin. So this is the Kanetusho, which was a coin used in the Edo period from 1626 to 1868. And so the Japanese characters are just telling you that this is a uh, uh, imperial coin, and then the hole in the center is is the sort of defining feature. Now, of course, the original coin would have been coin-sized, but it's been expanded and put onto this little incense burner. Now, to, again, if you're just joining me, I'll be delivering the lecture from right here tonight. You see a lot of the artwork that looks Japanese, and I think that's the sort of enduring legacy of J Japanese craft, ceramics, and objects on American studio pottery. And so particularly this time that the Smiths are collecting objects, uh, Japan is still in the 1960s and 70s, as it was for Frank Lloyd Wright in the 1890s, a great inspiration for design. Now there's this... Uh, Asian style lantern with the bells um, that could be Chinese, could be Japanese, most likely is American after an Asian model. And then there is this wonderful doll with kimono here in the window. She is from Okinawa, which is the island at the very southern end of the Japanese uh, islands. And so she has a very distinct uh, physicality to her. And the people of Okinawa are known for their distinctive look that is different from the rest of the Japanese mainland, as well as for a different way of folding and wearing kimono. And then I think the last piece that I want to show you, unless anyone has any questions, is right outside. And... This is the little Toro Lantern. And the Toro Lantern is a stone lantern for the garden, usually a square base and then an octagonal uh, top, which we have here. And then it has the little Hoju, or the onion, on the top of the lantern. And they originally would have had a, a light box in it, but the form sort of evolves over the centuries, and so this is essentially a blind Toru lantern that, that you would not light. But it's situated here with this majestic weeping willow behind it, um, and then you have all the sort of lines of the patio extending out into the landscape. Here on the first day of fall, everything looking really quite stunning. And so as I step out and look back at the house, you see the way that Frank Lloyd Wright builds, not with sort of rice paper and wood uh, and, and very light construction like the Japanese, but this American interpretation of Japanese architecture where you still have uh, window frames that, that read almost like screens. You have this sort of dominant grid uh, that has been prominent in Japanese architecture since the 1500s, and Frank Lloyd Wright is really adapting it for his new form of architecture. And just like Japanese houses, the whole thing opens to ventilate, so you can see I have one corner open so that it will cross-breeze to the front door. And now we're out here, we see our Japanese-style garden that was just replanted by Fleur Detroit uh, after our historic landscape study and a series of sort of specimen azaleas and junipers. So, uh, yes, the, the, the lantern in the Japanese garden at Cranbrook is also a Toro lantern and it has a more specific name for the style of temple that it is from. Uh, that lantern is, of course, much grander. Um, Either way, Japanese lanterns had been for sale really since the 1870s in America. And so uh, the, the Smiths did not get the stone lantern direct from Japan, but they could have bought it from a retailer that was importing uh, stone lanterns. I hope that was interesting for all of you to just 
it's it's always fun with the Smith House collection to take a sort of thematic approach to it. So if you're just joining Live at Five for one of the first times, go back in our Instagram page and you'll see that I've done a ceramics history of Smith House. I've done an architecture look. I've done a look at our furniture and how we've restored the furniture, as well as countless tours from the main Cranbrook campus. We also do Live at Five tours on Wednesdays and Facebook Live, and you'll see there on the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research page that uh, there are now seven and a half months worth of Wednesday tours on Facebook, including an hour-long tour of the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House that will tell you more about who these miraculous school teachers, Melvin and Sarah Smith, were. This was their dream house. It was really a coup that they pulled off building it and then filling it with their art. Now, I'm going to head back inside and just make one more pitch for tonight's Uncovering Cranbrook lecture. Uh, the lecture will start promptly at 7 o'clock Eastern. I'll be delivering it here from the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House and it's going to concern Frank Lloyd Wright's long romance with Japan, uh, how he designed Japanese buildings, how he was influenced by Japanese uh, culture in Chicago, and then how he became a uh, renowned world-leading dealer in Japanese prints, and how all of that influence and contact with Japan and with Asian art influenced the design of his buildings. I've already done the lecture once today at 10 a.m., and I think that it went very well, so I have now spent the next hours torturing myself and fixing the slides that I thought didn't work, so it's going to be even better tonight at 7. Uh, you can buy tickets at center.cranbrook.edu. The tickets will be on sale through 6 o'clock. If you've signed up, you should get the Zoom link by 6.15. Uh, if you don't, go ahead and email center at cranbrook.edu. Thanks so much for joining me for another Live at Five. Uh, there's always more to learn about Cranbrook, and I'll be back next Tuesday from another spot on campus. Tomorrow on Facebook Live at Five, I'll be broadcasting from the Cranbrook House Gardens, uh, the George and Ellen Scripps Booth Gardens around Cranbrook House. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see, hopefully, all of you at... Uh, seven o'clock. If you are watching this and it's not live, um, and this is the recorded version, you too can watch the lecture. Uh, just email center at cranbrook.edu and we'll tell you how to pay the $20 ticket price and we'll send you a link to the recording. So have a good one, everyone. Enjoy the first day of fall. Go and get your fall flavored uh, uh, foods and beverages and candles and pillows and just don your sweaters because summer is over and we are headed into the most glorious, most Frank Lloyd Wright friendly time of year. See you next Tuesday, everyone.